So today I'm going to pick up right where I left off last time, uh, talking about how sequence alignment relates to uh, database searching. And we're mostly going to be focusing on BLAST because it's the most commonly used application for matching a single sequence or a moderate number of sequences to an entire database. And I'll compare BLAST with the Smith-Waterman type method that we talked about and the FASTA method that I ended up uh, toward the end of last week. And I'm going to introduce some statistics, review the same statistics that I went over last time about how the BLAST calculates its E-values, um, how BLAST deals with gaps, which is different than some other alignment methods, um, this concept of high scoring segment pairs, which BLAST calls HSPs. And then I'm going to introduce briefly some more advanced alignment and database searching methods, just to give you a hint of other things that are out there, each of which you know, has its own algorithms and advantages and disadvantages. Um, particularly, I'm going to mention PsyBLAST and BLAT. And, and you'll see how they're basically tweaking some of the parameters that we've been talking about. Uh, things like matrices for scoring and word sizes for making hashes and, and that sort of thing. So, when I talk about BLAST, it's a program that was written by Altschul et al. at the NCBI. Um, it's an acronym. It stands for Basic Local Alignment Search Tool. I described the difference between global and local alignments last time. So BLAST is always thinking about making a local alignment, which means parts of one sequence aligned with parts of other sequences another sequence, and then extending that region of match as far as makes sense, but not forcing a global alignment. Um, there's a web server, which is how most people use BLAST. It uh, allows you to query against GenBank and various predefined subsets of GenBank. Things like non-redundant, which is the most commonly searched database. Um, it's essentially the full set of GenBank, but obviously duplicated sequences are removed. Um, month, if you have a sequence and you just want to see if anything new has been added to GenBank that matches it, so things that were added in the last month. ESTs, specific genomes such as human, Drosophila, yeast, E. coli, have pre-computed BLAST searches. Um, there's also sets of protein databases, which can be searched by automatic translation. You can also customize your BLAST search with an entree style query so that you could limit it to, say, a particular taxonomic group. Um, BLAST is a big parallel computing infrastructure, and, and it's quite fast, but it's shared by everyone in the world. So the amount of time that it takes to do a given query sort of depends on how happy that computer is and what sort of load it's, ha it, it's dealing with at the moment that you submit your query. BLAST uses word matching or hashing, um, which is essentially like a dictionary lookup that we already looked at when we were studying Python. Um, unlike FASTA, which uses exact matching so that whatever chunk, whatever Kamer size of your query sequence you choose has to exactly match a similar chunk in a database sequence. BLAST uses similar word matching. Um, if you remember how a dictionary lookup works, it only works for an exact match. You can only look in the dictionary for a keyword of a specific sort. And since the keywords in this case are Kamer's, BLAST achieves its similar matching by first taking each word from your query sequence and creating a cloud around it of other similar words. So it expands the query space, and then it takes each one of those matching words and it does a, a keyword lookup, a hash, against sequences from the database. An advantage of this sort of matching method is that if there's no word matches, 
then there's no alignment. So it saves a lot of time compared to doing Smith-Waterman where you have to compute every possible frame of alignment for two sequences that don't have any significant similarity or don't really have a, a diagonal of matching. So it allows you to do that quick first pass searching for chunks of similarity very quickly with a hash and then move on. Um, I'm going to show an, an improvement in the BLAST algorithm which came out in the late 90s called Gap Blast, which basically requires that instead of having a single word match, it requires two matching words between your query and the database sequence. And since there's two matching words, they can have a little bit of space between them, which allows a lot more control over uh, gapped alignments. Um, there's also custom client programs so that if you have a lot of BLAST searches that you want to do, you could set up one of these clients to send multiple sequences to the server um, in a programmatic fashion. Okay, a little bit of graphics. So, for the query, you find a list of words of length w. By high scoring words, they mean first you break the query into all of its constituent words, and then for each word, you allow for certain mismatches that are themselves quite similar using a scoring table, like the PAM or Blossom table that we talked about last week. So only words that are sufficiently similar with a high blossom in this case score between amino acids uh, will be allowed. If you're doing just a DNA to DNA match, then you have to you would allow say one mismatch in an 11 base DNA word would have a sufficiently high score. So you'd create a cloud of all the possible single base mismatches of and that would be your set of, of words. And for each word in the query sequence, all right, so this is just creating your query words. Then you compare your list of words to the database, and you identify exact matches of your query words. So the query words may be slightly different from the words in your sequence, but in this matching step, you're doing a true hash or a true dictionary lookup and only finding the exact matches. Um, another picture of basically the same thing. Um, Preprocess the query, compile the short high scoring word list from the query. So the length of the query word is three. And these are examples of other high scoring words, other high scoring three letter protein camers or words that would be sufficiently similar that BLAST would add them to the query list. And in this case, there's a pre-computed threshold of 13, which is being drawn from one of those scoring tables, right? So each of the amino acids would have a range of other amino acids that has a sufficiently high blossom similarity score. OK, so you make a hash table of this, which is like creating a dictionary. And then you match that hash table to a hash table that was already computed for a database sequence. You find those matches, and then you try and extend the matches one letter at a time between the two sequences. Every letter that you add, if it's a matching letter, increases the score. Or if it's a non-matching letter, but it has a... Has a uh, blossom table lookup that has a positive score means that these are two evolutionarily similar amino acids that would increase your score when you add another pair of amino acids in that alignment that has a negative score you know your overall score goes down and if the next one is also a negative score then probably the alignment would stop because it wants to find a maximum scoring segment pair, meaning you know, uh, a short region of alignment between your query sequence and this database sequence. 
and these are what they call maximum segment pairs. When, the, when adding more um, amino acids or more bases doesn't make sense and it doesn't make the query better, it stops. And then that overall segment pair has an overall uh, score, which is just the sum of the matches. So in the BLAST2, it requires two word matches. And I should say that BLAST2 is the default. It's what you get if you run the BLAST plus algorithm on your machine or if you go to the NCBI website. They, they used to call it BLAST2 when it was new, and now it's just what they use for BLAST. And it, so this requires that there's two word matches in that initial lookup and that they are close to each other. And that close is a parameter that's defined by default, but you could uh, change it in the advanced settings. So it looks something like this. You have a query word that matches here and another query word that matches here, and there's a defined distance between them. The double match is now enough to trigger the alignment, and now it tries to extend this paired alignment outward in both directions, adding, uh, in this case, pairs of amino acids that have scores uh, until it reaches the end, until it doesn't, doesn't make sense to match anymore. Um, the advantage of the two-word match, obviously, is there's a lot fewer false positives. There's a lot fewer alignments that are triggered by sequences that are actually unrelated but share a very small region of similarity or identity. And so by reducing the number of false positives, the algorithm wastes less time trying to extend sort of unprofitable short alignments, and it could spend more time trying to extend the good ones. So overall, the two-match system increases both specificity and sensitivity and greatly speeds up the runtime. So using this approach, BLAST achieves pretty good speed. I mean, obviously it depends on what computer and how much RAM and CPU you have to give to it, but it's at least a thousand times faster than FASTA. And for many applications, it's the best available sequence matching approach that combines both sensitivity and specificity. There are other methods that are faster, but they're less sensitive. And what less sensitive means is that they won't find matches between sequences that differ by a moderate amount. So I'll get back to this when we talk about more advanced methods, but when you're doing a database search using an alignment-based search method, you have to think of it as an experiment. And an experiment should have a hypothesis. So, and your hypothesis should have enough detail in it that you could say, you know, I'm expecting to find a match in this genome for this sequence of, you know, of this percent identity, roughly. And you should know if you're have a human sequence and you're looking in the human genome, then the match should be at the level of error in your sequencing method. So you're looking for something like 98 or 99 percent identity. If your query sequence is coming from one species and you're looking for a match in another species, you should have some rough idea of the level of sequence conservation between those two species. You know, between mouse and human, you might expect sort of 95% protein identity for most proteins, a little more for highly conserved proteins, less for highly diverged proteins. If you were trying to match between bacteria and human, then you would expect a very, very low level of sequence identity, maybe, you know, a lot of matches that would be below the threshold of significance, and it would be challenging for BLAST or any other algorithm. But you should try and tune your algorithm for maximum sensitivity and be ready to accept a lot of false positives. Okay, so the output of this BLAST method, 
is oh question yeah It's, it's set by default, but you can go in there and alter that among other parameters in the advanced settings. So what are the criteria to determine the length of gap between two words? Well, it's very empirical, right? It's like, it depends on a lot of things, what's going to work. And the reason they have default settings is because they've tested out a number of different sequences and a number of different queries sort of posed by an arbitrary group of biologists testing out the tool. And they've set the default at what seems to work well, given the defaults of all the other parameters. You know, so just changing one parameter is actually going to have some ripple effects. And you might need to change a bunch of others to compensate and, and give you a good balance between specificity and sensitivity. So most of the time, that's not the first thing you would change. The, the thing that you would most likely want to play around with is the, uh, the scoring matrix. You could say, well, I'm going to be looking for a more distant homology. And so I want to use a blossom matrix that's more tolerant of more amino acid differences and, and gives a better score for those. Changing the gap parameter is sort of more fundamental and really hard to predict what's the outcome. It's not been sort of empirically validated under every possible set of circumstances. So I wouldn't do that unless you had a strong reason to. But it's one of those things where, yes, it's there for you. It's a manipulable tool. So the output of this algorithm is what they call an HSP, a high scoring segment pair. It's a two word match that's been extended in both direction until adding more letters doesn't help the overall alignment and in fact reduces your net score. Very frequently you can produce several short HSPs as the alignment between a query and a target sequence. Um, that could happen for any number of reasons. One being that one sequence has an insertion with respect to the other. Another being that there's actually two conserved domains and there's an intervening region that you know, has less structure and is more free to absorb evolutionary changes. But Unfortunately, the way BLAST calculates its statistics, it produces a statistic, what they call an E-value, for each of those aligned regions separately. And it doesn't combine them together to give you the true probability that two sequences would match and produce these two aligned regions. That's just a failing of the system. And so really similar sequences will probably align over their entire region but as the amount of similarity declines the chance that you're going to get two or more HSP regions with separate e-values is going to increase and then if you sort your results by e-value which is the way they're presented by default you may not be getting the true e-value, you're going to get the e-value of the biggest or the best scoring HSP. And that's just a feature of BLAST. And, and I don't know of anyone who's come up with a statistical method that would allow you to combine those two e-values and recalculate the probability of match to produce that. It's just a weakness of the system, but even still, it's the best and most used uh, system for doing this kind of alignment. Um, what, you, yeah, what you might do is once you've done your database search, you might go and take those two sequences and realign them by another method, such as Smith-Waterman, where compute time doesn't matter because you're now only working with two sequences as opposed to taking one and searching <coughs> it against many millions. So this is a typical um, BLAST output, you have to get used to viewing it, interpreting it, you know, just learning what it's telling you. The thing that people look at first is this E-value. 
We talked about how it's calculated. I'm going to review it in a second. The, it's an exponential, so the larger the negative exponent, the smaller the probability, and therefore the more significant, or you could say the less likely this alignment is a result of chance. And you know, we typically use biological cutoff of something like 0 0.05. And so that would be, you know, e to the minus 2. And here we have e to the minus 71. So, you know, there's very, very, very little chance, you know, inf infinitesimally small chance that this alignment is produced as noise. It's a true alignment. These two sequences almost certainly have a biologically real relationship. And you might also infer that they are, in fact, homologous. They are descending from some common ancestor. Um, other things that it calculates for you, it has a bit score, which is like the raw score, coming from the sum of all the individual matches. It has a number of identities over the length of the aligned region. It has a percent identity. It tells you how many gaps there are in the sequence. This one has zero gaps. And it tells you the strand of the two sequences if you're doing a DNA to DNA alignment. Or even if you're taking a protein and you're searching against the DNA, it'll tell you if you're matching the plus or minus strand of the DNA. Um, plus and minus is sometimes arbitrary. It just means forward to the way you've submitted the query sequence. Um, the vertical lines in the, this DNA-DNA alignment represent identities, and nothing represents a non-identity. Um, you could learn a little more just by sort of sliding your finger along this uh, alignment, and you could say that the identical, at, well, the mismatches are distributed somewhat randomly across the entire sequence, which is probably indicative of true evolutionary change over time. So these two sequences are probably not of the exact same gene from the exact same species. They're from homologous genes, which could be members of a multi-gene family if you were you know, working within one species, or two species that you know, are moderately distant from each other at 86% identity. You would probably expect that at this level of similarity, these are protein coding sequences. You wouldn't likely see this much similarity between non-coding regions. So there's quite a bit that you can infer just from looking at the raw blast output. And being able to interpret that is uh, an important skill. This is just a glimpse of one particular version of the BLAST web server. NCBI very frequently changes the look of this tool, very, very frequently. And I didn't choose to grab a screenshot of the way it looks today. So that's just the way it goes. But it always has the same basic setup. There's a place to paste in your query sequence. There's a place to there's a pull-down menu to choose from the available databases that you can search. This is a feature that changes very frequently what they decide people want to search. Um, things come and go in terms of popularity. Mostly the options tend to increase over time, but now and then they decide something is not worthwhile anymore and they, they remove it. Um, Options for advanced, nowadays there's a, a button you have to push to open up the advanced options, and there are many of them. One of the options that's particularly helpful is that you can limit your query by entree group, meaning taxonomy. So you can search a particular species, a particular genus, family, all insects, all mammals, you know, which is really helpful because the statistics are calculated based on the size of your database. It's in the formula, right? There's a, there's a, there's a 
a factor in the formula for calculating the e-value, which is the size of the query database. So as you search a smaller database, uh, an alignment of the exact same quality with the same raw score gets a better e-value because the chance to make a, a, a random match is lower as the size of the database you search is, is reduced. So if you can limit your query space, you should. Sometimes, you, you, if you, you, know, you could even game the system. You could search everything. You find a match to a reasonably closely related species. You go back and reconfigure this and repeat the search, limiting your search to a more to a tighter taxonomic group. And that, will, that BLAST statistic is also valid, but you would need to report your BLAST result and include in that report what database you searched, technically the version of the database, the day the search was done, etc. People don't always do that. They often just say there's a BLAST match of such and such an e-value between my query and this database sequence. But in fact, the e-value is dependent on the version and size of the database you're searching. I'm also down here under um, optional parameters. There's an e-value cutoff. Here it's called expect. And so what that does is it only shows you the matches that are at least that good. Now an expect value of 10 is pretty loose because an e-value of 1 is equivalent to a random match. So in this case, you would get things that are much worse than random, but that's possible. But sometimes if you're looking for very, very distant matches, they may not be statistically significant, but they still are meaningful to you in the context of whatever question your hypothesis is particularly if you're starting with a small sequence, it may not be possible to get a high statistically significant score, yet the places where it matches are interesting to you and therefore you may want to set that e-value very high. Um, the word size, that's the, the size of the words that you use in the lookup table. Um, if you change it from the default, it changes the results very greatly. So you would only do that if, say, your, mat, your, your lookup didn't work, and now you want to do a much more sensitive, much less stringent search using a bigger word. Um, you can also change the matrix. The default here is Blossom62. It's chosen empirically, meaning it gives a result for a typical BLAST search. Given all the searches that come in over the course of a day, most people end up happy with the result when it's set this way. But if your hypothesis is that you're looking for a nearly exact match, you could set this to be more stringent, you know, Blossom 80 or something like that. Or if you know that your query is very distant, from the species that you're looking in, you could set this lower. And then it will escalate. It will improve the, the matching scores for somewhat more evolutionarily distant amino acid pairs. That's really what it does. It changes the score of amino acid pairs. And in a sense, when you think about how it takes the query and it creates a little cloud of matching words around that query before it does the database lookup, by setting the Blossom matrix lower, you would get a bigger cloud of words and therefore be more likely to land a two-word match and, and grow an alignment. So it increases the sensitivity at the cost of less specificity in your, uh, in your search. In other words, you'll get more false positives. So the needle, the, the needleman wunsch and Smith-Waterman methods only produce a score, uh, an account of matches or mismatches, depending on what scoring system you've chosen. They don't produce a statistic to tell you whether that score is 
meaningful. Biological meaning really has to be provided by you, the investigator, but at least we could come up with a statistical meaning. Is this match better than we would find just taking some randomized sequence and querying it against this, the second sequence? If we took a random sequence as our first one, aligned it to the second one, what's the best score we're likely to get if we try a bunch of different random ones? So we need an unbiased method to compare alignments and judge if they're significant. So in a large database search, the scores of good alignments differ from random alignments. Obviously, random alignments are going to cluster around a certain sort of average score. You know, one out of four DNA bases is going to match. So you're going to get a random score of 25% identity just in general. Um, and then there's going to be some sort of tails to that. One of those tails is going to be much longer, which is the one that represents actually significant matches, similar genes. And then at the very end of that long tail is going to be the true homologs. And so we call that an extreme value distribution. And we need to use an appropriate statistical test rather than one that's based on the assumption of normality. So this is what a normal curve looks like. And this is what an extreme value curve looks like. It has an extended tail off to the right for those rare but much more meaningful, highly significant scores that would not occur very often with a randomized sequence. So, Pearson, when he was developing his FASTA software, did this um, experiment where he took a bunch of random sequences and he matched them to a query. And he demonstrated that those sequences do, in fact, follow this extreme value distribution very closely. And then out here, more uh, rarely are the actual matching sequences. And so the developers of BLAST use this equation to calculate their E value, which is a statistical measure of how likely a given raw score is to be a true alignment versus a random one. So the, the smaller the E value, the less likely the alignment is to be random. The parameters for this, while E is the E value that we're going to report, M is the query length. So it's proportional to query length. If you have a very small query, then it's not possible to get a very powerful, very significant E value. If you just think about it, you know, if you had an eight base query, it's going to randomly match any sort of database many, many times. And so your best E value is probably going to be 1, because any random 8-mer is going to match just as well as your 8-mer. Somewhere out around 14 or 15, you start to separate from the noise. Around 20 to 25, you can actually start to get meaningful answers from the BLAST algorithm. N is the length of the database sequence. Well, n is the length of the matching database sequence. So the sequence you're, you're aligning to now and that matching region. S is the raw score, which comes from the blossom table. Or if it's DNA, DNA match, it just gets you know ones and minus ones for matches and mismatches. And there's a gap element that goes into computing that raw score as well. Gaps get penalized. And then k is a constant for the size of the database. So again, if you make the database smaller, then you can get um, higher E values for the same raw score. The same alignment will give you a better E value, you know, smaller, not really higher, smaller, more significant E value. So if you can search a smaller database, it's, it's to your advantage. And then lambda is a constant that's drawn from this extreme value distribution. So you're pulling things out of there, and that goes into the model. So it's an exponential function in lambda and s of the raw score. 
e to the negative lambda s, and then just multiplied by these three um, other parameters. So the e value, you can, yeah. Yes, it actually works better for proteins. All the aspects of BLAST are really much more powerful for proteins. The DNA matches suffer from a lot of noise, and the statistics that you get are, are considerably less trustworthy. For example, the scoring matrix is somewhat arbitrary, plus one, minus one for DNA. Whereas for proteins, the scoring matrix is blossom. It's the product of a lot of evolutionary information. And so that score, you know, it means something. And so BLAST reports a lot more relevant and specific information for a protein alignment than it does for a DNA alignment. Even still, it's the best DNA alignment method that we have for searching somewhat diverged sequences. We have better methods for very, very similar sequences, nearly identical ones, but BLAST has this power to reach down to maybe 80 or 75 percent sequence identity, maybe as low as 50, and that's hard to do with other algorithms that can also scale to get through a very large database in a reasonable amount of time. So you can treat an E value in the same way that you would treat a P value that you compute from a statistical test. And if the E value is smaller than 0.05, we usually say that it's significant. Although in my experience, an E value of uh, to the E to the minus 10 is more reasonable to say that two sequences are likely to be related in a biological sense. Um, the, the problem is that calculating things from based against random doesn't account for the fact that the genes in a database are not drawn randomly. There's a, a restricted vocabulary. There's sort of many repeating motifs that occur very frequently among genes that are not truly biologically related. They're sort of convergent evolution. There's pressure on them to be spelled with a consistent vocabulary, a relatively even distribution of GC. There's lots of constraints. So you get an E value, you know, E to the minus three, E to the minus four. That's probably not super convincing that two sequences are truly biologically related, unless that was what you were expecting. You know, you were starting with sequences that you expected to be very distantly related. If you were working with sequences from closely related species, you would expect a much, much smaller E value to represent truly homologous sequences. So, you could think of it this way. The E value represents the likelihood that the observed alignment is due to chance alone. Yeah? Regarding E value, let's say you have like um, 10 to the minus 3. Um, can you interpret it as um, you get 1 out of 10,000 um, query matching? Well, yeah, you could say that you have a 1 in 10,000 chance that this occurred randomly rather than by true biological relationship. So that means you, you, you get um, one query if you, um, if you run the blast 1,000 times. That's no, you'll get the same result every time. If you ran the blast 1,000 times with 1,000 different queries, that's what you would get. Yeah, if you ran it with a thousand different randomized queries, you would get a score that good one time. That's really what it means. So a value of one indicates that an alignment this good would happen by chance with any random sequence. So if you had, 
10 to the minus 3, then yeah, then you'd have an alignment this good one time out of 1,000 with a random sequence. If you had, ten, if you had just an e value of 1, that means basically every time you put a random sequence in, you're likely to get a match this good. Which is not very interesting unless that was the best you could have expected because your query was small or you're looking for a very distant match and you're just using BLAST as a tool to guide you to things that match that good and you're not really saying these are, a lot, these are uh, homologous sequences simply by the quality of this match. So there's lots of times when you use BLAST to match up things when you're not expecting a good match. Again, having a hypothesis going in leads you to the interpretation of the results. Also, often you get many blast matches when you take a query, right? Because it's matching everything in the database and it's reporting all the matches that are better than the threshold. And by default, the threshold is 10. So it's actually going to report matches that are worse than random. And so what you'll typically see is a descending set of matches. And you typically focus on the best ones that are near the top that have the smallest E values. And if you do see a series of descending E values, that suggests that in this genome or in this database, there are many sequences that match your query which suggests, say, if you have a gene and you pulled it out of organism X, that many other organisms have genes that are in some way related. Yeah? I just don't understand what, what would be the case when you have worse than one. Like you did a query with a 15 base DNA primer. And since the formula has a factor in it for the length of the query, it can't get a score better than one, even if it was perfect. That's when you would get it. That's an, an example. Another thing, well, we'll, skip, we'll get to that in a little later. And if you want to read more explanation of the statistics, read the essay by Stephen Altschul at this, uh, a, this address, part of the BLAST documentation. And, you know, He's much more mathematically precise. It may or may not um, make more sense to you than what I've just said. <laughs> I've taken a class from him. It was tough going. <laughs> He's a very mathematical thinker. OK, built into BLAST is an automatic translation feature. Um, they are actually separate executables, separate programs that from the website you can trigger just by Actually, it's not a pull down anymore. Now you have to go and choose the correct tab. If you're running BLAST as a command line program, say on the cluster computer that we have here, you would choose to run the BLASTX program separately rather than the BLASTN program, which is for nucleotides. BLASTX is for translation. So it will take a query sequence. Maybe it's an mRNA that you've pulled up in some experiment and translate it in all six reading frames and then take each one of those and do a protein-based BLAST against a protein database using the power that I already explained that BLAST is much more sensitive for protein searches. So this is definitely the preferred way of finding something that's similar to this amazing mRNA that I pulled up in my experiment but I don't know what it is. Um, you can also go the other way around. If you have a protein and you don't have proteins for your organism, you only have a poor quality draft genome or a collection of ESTs or something like that, you could translate the database in all six reading frames and compare that to your query protein. That's called tblastn. There's also one called tblastx, which is a double translation. You have a protein coding uh, DNA or RNA sequence. You only have DNA or RNA from your target organism, and you translate them both, and then you do protein-to-protein -protein comparison. This takes some extra time, but again, it's really worth it because you have much more power in a protein-to-protein -protein match.
So you would only use BLAST in its DNA to DNA mode if the sequence you are working with is not protein coding. You know, it's a chunk of genome, you want to match it to another chunk of genome. That's really the only time you would use the BLAST DNA search. Despite that, on the NCBI, the vast majority of the searches people do are DNA DNA, indicating that they have not taken this course. You've probably seen this before. BLAST on the website produces this graphical output. Um, what it's showing you are the regions of alignment. These are what they call the HSPs. Um, and this gappy thing in the middle, which is showing hashy lines, is a region that's not aligned. So there's an alignment here, which has one E value, and an alignment over here, which has another E value. Each line, each horizontal line in this diagram represents a different database sequence that matches your query. They're color coded, so the red ones are really good matches. E values better than 200, E to the minus 10 to the minus 200. Um, the pink ones are also very good. Um, the green ones, not so good. The blue ones are pretty crummy, and the black ones are not really worth talking about. They're, they're similar or below background noise. Um, what you'll typically see is that the red and the purple HSPs are quite long, and the blue ones are short, and they can be sort of randomly distributed all over the place. So those are more or less background noise. After that, in the output, is a list of the matching database sequences. It has some sort of ID. It's a composite of a GenBank ID and a couple of other uh, database cross-references. So this is a GI number, which tells you essentially nothing. And then there's a SwissProt number for this one. And there's also a SwissProt ID for this one. Not everything has a meaningful SwissProt ID. This one only has a GenBank accession number. Um, and very frequently, there are many very similar database entries. Um, they're supposed to be not identical if you've chosen the non-redundant, but they're still quite similar. What you'll also see is that they're ranked by E-value score. Um, it's, if you've searched the whole of GenBank or the whole of GenBank protein, you'll very typically get a series of declining score matches from very, very good to getting worse. And that probably means that those are more distantly related species that still have a recognizably homologous sequence to your query. So that's a good indication that your high quality matches are not due to chance. It's simply the best of available biologically significant matches. Um, also, if you're working with a um, multi-gene family, you're going to get multiple matches per species. And it's actually perhaps quite challenging to tease out what are the orthologs and what are the paralogs when you go within a species and across to other species. BLAST is simply scoring them, and it has, it has the deficit that it's scoring only the aligned regions. So in a case like this, there's going to be two matches for every sequence and it's a little bit of luck whether the alignment extends further or shorter into this uh, gap region in between. So the e-values are a very strong tool but they're not the absolute final word on the similarity between your sequence and that uh, other sequence. So here's an alignment, yeah. Hmm? I don't remember. <laughs> and I don't think they show the uh, results in this format anymore. I just grabbed this and it was nicely formatted, so I didn't make a new one today. <laughs>
So here's a, uh, an example of a protein alignment. And also this is old. They typically don't show it in quite this format anymore. The, the feature that I want to point out is this string of X's here. We'll get to that in a minute when I talk about filtering. But BLAST is sensitive or it has a weakness for certain repeating motifs that show up in a lot of proteins. There are, um, well, there's certain amino acids that sort of tend to come in clumps and they show up in a bunch of different proteins, but they're not truly homologous. They're not descent. They're not descended from a common ancestor. So if you have a lot of G's and L's in your sequence, and that's the only thing that matches, then that's probably not a true biologically interesting match. And, and what they call that is skewed composition. And so BLAST has a query filter. And basically, any of the words in your query sequence that match a little dictionary that they have for known overrepresented words that, that show up way more often than they should in the database, it just blocks out those words from the query. And in this version of BLAST, it printed X's for the region of the query that was blocked. In more recent versions of BLAST, they've done an intelligent thing. They've blocked those words for the database searching, but when they finally draw this alignment in the output, they go back and replace the letters. So unless you turn off that feature, which is called block repeated words for search only, or something to that effect, by default, it will replace these X's with the proper letters from your query sequence. And I think it will also add in the matches in the center column and adjust the statistic to include those matches in the overall computation of percent identity and, and E value. So as it's shown here, the top line is your query sequence. The third line is the database sequence. It's called subject. And the line in between is printed as the letter of the amino acid if they are identical, a plus symbol if the blossom table lookup between those two amino acids gives a positive score, and nothing if the blossom table lookup between those two amino acids gives zero or a negative score. Um, Again, if you see a random distribution of plus signs, that's a strong indication that you're dealing with two evolutionarily related sequences that have undergone mutation and selection. The selection being those mutations which cause an amino acid change that's structurally damaging to the protein will not be preserved, but those amino acid changes that are sort of structurally neutral will be allowed. And so when you see almost no plus signs, but lots of gaps, now you, well, lots of gaps in the alignment, right? Not, not inserted gaps, but lots of places where the sequences don't match. Now you have to worry, are these two sequences alike due to some other non-random bias, like they have a lot of E's and G's in them or something like that. Um, so you worry about that. If you see a, a good amount of plus signs, maybe you know, equal to a quarter or a third of the non-matching amino acids, then you're more confident that the differences between your query and your database match are evolutionary differences. And that's additional evidence for homology that you know, they're descended from a common ancestor by a process of mutation. So again, you look at the E value, it's E to the minus 75. That's very small, very unlikely to occur by chance. You look at the percent identity, 53% is considered very high for a protein-protein match. Uh, 
generally our cutoff for significance in protein protein matches is somewhere around 25 percent for a query sequence longer than 100 amino acids that's a rule of thumb kind of thing um, it has a few gaps but they don't amount to a large percent of the alignment these are things that you can infer just by looking at this alignment All right, I already said this, BLAST tends to break alignments into non-overlapping segments. Um, it takes shortcuts. It looks for nearly identical words, particularly in DNA. It has 11 bases. Um, it uses two or three amino acid protein words. Um, because this is a heuristic, right, it's a shortcut method, it's possible to design a sequence that will be missed by BLAST. It will miss some similarities. We, we sometimes call that a pathological sequence, one where there's a mutation every 10 bases. That's not very likely to happen in a true biological setting. You would think that somewhere in, two, in the sequence of two truly homologous entities, whether they're genes or proteins or tRNAs or whatever, that there be some region of 11 bases that shares good similarity, 90% similarity, 90% identity. Um, but there are cases where BLAST will miss because the level of different divergence is, is uniform. And so, you know, you have two sequences that are 85% similar, but they have, they do, they do not share a pair of nearby matching words at the standard threshold. So that would be a case where if you were relatively sure that there, you should have found a match, that you would want to go in and start tweaking those thresholds, tweak the word size, tweak the, the, max, the minimum score of similarity between the words, etc. More concerning is that it makes many false positives. Again, because biological databases are not truly random, they're highly skewed for meaningful sequences. Um, at the DNA level, the GC content is roughly equal, um, although there are some stretches of low compositionally uninteresting sequence, you know, a string of ATs or a string of As, that happens as well. And so naturally, two genes with strings of ATs in them could have several 11 base matching words and they'd be aligned by chance but in fact they're not um, homologous they're not derived from a, an ancestor gene so at the level of sensitivity that most biologists like to work moderately sensitive or quite sensitive and moderately tolerant of false positives you're going to get a fair number of false positives i'd say the default settings of BLAST have been tweaked to be more tolerant of false positives because biologists are more annoyed by missing a true match than they are by getting a moderate number of false positive matches. So in general, you should be more vigilant about false positives and only shift your attention to what did I miss if you really fail to get any match when you expected that you should have gotten a match. So take the default settings first and only make them less stringent if you really have a good reason to. Um, this thing of repeats and skewed composition are the problems that bedevil BLAST the most. Um, repeat sequences are obviously all over the genome and there's nothing you can do about it. There's no simple statistical method for filtering them out. Yes, we could filter out a few very high count camers, but even still moderately repeated sequences that occur, you know, in the genome, but not hundreds of thousands of times are, are still going to skew our results. And this idea of skewed composition occurs both in DNA and in protein. And one sequence that contains a lot of A's is going to match another sequence that contains a lot of A's. 
And, that, and you could generalize that, obviously, for any base or any amino acid. So you have to watch out for those things. At a higher complexity level, it might be that one transmembrane domain could match another transmembrane domain. And that might be interesting, but it might not represent a true biological orthology between two sequences. They could have developed those similar transmembrane domains by convergent evolution rather than descent from a common ancestor. So it's stuff to watch out for in the false positives. So NCBI blast is fast, but it does get busy and have its bad days. There's a fixed choice of databases, and it might not have the exact database that would really be optimal for the search that you want to run. Um, it does have uh, some repeat filtering turned on by default. So if your query sequence has an ALU in it, for example, and you're querying the human genome, it will filter that out by default and look for the flanking sequences in your query that don't have ALU in them. It has that nice graphical summary of output. And also, it has these hyperlinks. So very quickly, you can pull up the sequence of the matching database entry and see what you've got. So those are nice things about using the web blast. Um, I said that already. So very low E values, E smaller than 10 to the minus 100, are homologs or identical genes. Moderate E values are related genes, either parts of multi-gene families or related across species. Um, typically, if you get a long list of gradually declining E values, that indicates a large gene family, either within an organism or across organisms. If you don't get a long list of gradually declining E values, if you just get one match, then you're very suspicious because biology doesn't usually work that way. There's not usually just one sequence in the entire database that matches your query and nothing else that matches it a little worse and then a little worse than that. That's more like a chance similarity due to something, due to a repeat being present, skewed composition, some sort of cloning artifact. You know, so you would watch out for that. That's not the result that you would typically get. Long regions of moderate similarity are going to be more interesting than a very short region of identity. Again, that very short region of identity could be a skewed composition. It could be some sort of artifact. So moving on to sort of more advanced approaches. What do you do with a borderline match? Something in that 0.1 to 1.0 range. Um, this has been described as the twilight zone of similarity matching. One thing that you can do is retest the sequences and look for related hits. In other words, you've matched something in the database. Take that thing out of the database and use it as a second query. Take those matches that you get from that second query and compare them one by one to your original sequence. If the second query matches a bunch of things that are also similar to your original sequence, but you know slightly lower below the threshold, then you're probably on to something. You've matched the most similar of a group of similar sequences. On the other hand, if when you take your query and you do some matches, and you get a bunch of really good matches, and none of those things match the original sequence. You know, so you, you did a match, you got a distant match, you took that database entry, and you used it for a second search. It found matches, but none of those secondary matches are at all similar to your first match. Then it's, that pretty much tells you that your first match was bogus, it was a false positive, and you should probably not pursue that alignment as being meaningful. This is, a, this is really a statement that similarity is transitive. So if A matches B and B matches C, then A should also match C, perhaps at a slightly lower level. Makes perfect sense. 
Um, ultimately, the biological relevance of a database search is a statement that you have to figure out for yourself. The BLAST can only compute you a statistic and show you an alignment. All these other things have to be inferred from the nature of your query, the nature of the database you've chosen, some structural information that you can glean from looking at the alignment. And, and ultimately, it's a matter of what were you looking for? Were you looking for a short region of near identity or a large region of more general similarity? If there are mismatches, are they conservative? By that, I mean the, the plus signs that you would see in a protein-protein match. Are the matching regions important structural components of the genes, or have you matched some sort of intron or flanking region that's less likely to be biologically important? So the biggest factor that affects the results is which database you search. Choose to search protein databases whenever possible. They are smaller, less redundant. You'll get higher E values, meaning smaller E values. Uh, Non-identical letters will have information because you can use a, a lookup scoring matrix. Um, it's not always best to search the largest, most comprehensive database. The largest database is generally the GenBank NR, non-redundant. Um, but NR contains a lot of unannotated stuff. And you haven't gained a lot of information if your query sequence matches a hypothetical gene. You know that this sequence has been seen before in some assay, or it's been predicted as a coding sequence out of the genome sequence, but that's about all you know. If you were to search a smaller, better annotated database and get a match, even if that match was less statistically significant, you'd be able to infer more about the function of your query. So RefSeq is the best annotated DNA database. It's produced by sort of hand as well as algorithmic effort at GenBank. Um, the SwissPro UniPro database is the best, most annotated of the protein databases. So given your druthers, that would be the place to start. If you get no matches there, then you may have to default back to the most comprehensive possible database to say, has anybody ever seen any sequence like this one? Or is it really off the wall? Um, usually, you want to search annotated genes. If you don't find anything, you might go back to ESTs which are just sequences of RNA fragments. Um, if you search NR in GenBank, you're not getting ESTs. So you're pretty much only searching things that have some sort of annotation, even if that annotation is just hypothetical protein. So that's a place to go if your first search against NR didn't work, is to drop back and try and search ESTs. Um, if you do know what species you're interested in and you want to look just in that genome, that will get, make a much faster search with better E values. Or you could limit to just a phylum or something like that. Um, I showed this already, but here's, a, here's where that entree drop-down list is. And so you could, you could do viruses, bacteria, mammals, vertebrates, or you can type in the Latin name of the species. And, and get very specific. All right, I mentioned this before, but I'm going to get more specific about the built-in filters of BLAST. All of these are on by default, and you should be careful about turning them off. Since BLAST is easily fooled by repeats and low complexity sequences, and by low complexity, I mean enriched in just a few letters. Um, for DNA, you could call these microsatellites. Um, acidic, basic, proline-rich regions in proteins. So the default filters remove these low-complexity words from your query. And known repeats like ALU from DNA searches. Um, 
By default, the filters are removed in the final alignment. That's what I, I mentioned before, uh, filter for lookup only. That's, that's the term they use. And you could turn that off if you want, then you'll get the X's instead of having it filled back in at the end. Short sequences can't get good E values. What's the probability of finding a 12 base fragment in a random genome? So it's 4 to the 12th, so you get a match for every 16 million bases. Human genome, 3 billion bases, lots of matches for any 12 mer by chance. So the best possible E value you can get is actually going to be quite a lot higher than 1. I think it's going to be you know, something like 5 or 6 for a 12 mer. And so you can't use a 12 mer with BLAST, really because there's no way to tell the difference between real matches and, and random matches. So what length DNA fragment is needed? Well, if you use a 16 mer, you're going to get about one match by random chance in a human genome size chunk, 4 billion bases. So you need at least a 16 mer or a little bigger, 18 or so which coincidentally coincides with the size that you need to make a PCR primer in order for it to match the genome by hybridization. And so the BLAST rules and the physical kinetics of hybridizing nucleotides seem to follow about the same statistical distribution. BLAST uses a default word size of 11 bases for DNA. Short sequences will obviously have few words and very difficult to get two nearly adjacent words to, to match. Low quality sequences might have a sequencing error in every word. That's one of those pathological situations where BLAST could miss a true alignment. Megablast is a tool built into BLAST that, can use, that uses very large words, 28 bases rather than 11. It allows for faster alignment. Um, it does a nicer job matching RNA to genomes. And it allows for very large sequences to be used as queries and still process in a reasonable amount of time. Um, there's also a built-in tool in uh, BLAST that you can choose by, um, well, it'll, it'll actually recognize if you've added a short query sequence, and it will adjust the expect value up to 1,000. So it will print non-significant matches so that you can use BLAST for short queries. It's just that you can't t always tell the difference between a match that's meaningful and one that just popped up by chance. But if you really want to know how many times does this 15 mer, how many times is it found in the genome, or how many times is it found in just this one gene, you can, you can use this setting. So what if you need to do a lot of BLAST searches? You don't want to go on to the website and submit 10,000 searches. That would be boring. The BLAST server will accept a multi-sequence FASTA file as a query. Um, similarly, you don't want a web page with 10,000 results on it. That would also be boring to read. So you can choose to return your result in some computer readable format. Um, the preferred format, well, there's a tabular format that you can work with in Excel, sort by E value, sort by species, whatever you want. There's also an XML format, which is the preferred format if you're going to read your BLAST result with some kind of specific software. Um, there's also this client program that will allow you to make many BLAST submissions automatically over the network, and it actually hits a backdoor of NCBI, a little bit different queue than the web server, so it may have better performance. And there's Windows, Mac, and Unix versions of this client program.
you can set up a local blast on whatever computer you want to run it. There is Linux code freely available from NCBI. It's called Blast Plus. Don't be confused. That is the Blast that is running on the web server. It's a slightly more recent version than the original, so they changed the name a little bit. Um, it actually has significantly different, significant differences in the commands than the older code that was around a few years back. So you'll have to read the manual for Blast Plus to learn how to format your commands. Um, it can be easily installed on Linux and Mac OS. There's instructions. Windows, you would need to run a, a Linux emulator, something, well, we'll get to that separately. Um, also, Chibi has a compute cluster called Phoenix. Any grad student can get uh, an account on it. It's not exactly free, so I won't say that, but it won't be very costly for your mentor. And if you're taking a class that requires it, We'll give it to you for free. We're not requiring you to use that server for this class, but I will use it in my bioinformatics class. Um, Blast is already installed, so you have access to it there with um, pretty high compute power. Um, it's not actually more powerful than the NCBI server, but it's not being divided up among 100,000 simultaneous users. So you can access more power for your searches. Um, it has a command line interface. Technically, it is possible to set up your own blast with your own web interface on your own computer. But not too many people bother with that, because if you want the power of having a local blast, you probably want to interact with it using scripts rather than a web, fr web front end. Um, the command line blast is easily scriptable just with a Linux shell script. You could write some Python code to submit blast queries. Or you could use BioPython, which has a whole module specifically for running command line blast and parsing the results. And, and it works pretty nicely. If you use local blast, you need to have a local database. It's not a great idea to download all of GenBank and put it on your laptop. GenBank runs to, I don't know, a couple terabytes. So that's not great. Um, we don't actually have a full copy of GenBank on the Chibi cluster. We'd prefer that you sent your full GenBank queries using one of the, the net clients to, to GenBank and use local blast for smaller custom built databases that target something you're really interested in. It's not completely absurd to have the whole protein database locally. I've done a number of projects that have downloaded a significant chunk of the UniProt database and then searched every predicted protein from a novel genome against that. That takes some time, but it's doable on our cluster. It would not be doable on a laptop. It would take months. But if you wanted to query every sequence from a new genome against every known protein from your favorite model system, that's entirely doable on a local blast and would take a few hours to run. So how do you do that? Well, you get your query database as a FASTA file, hopefully proteins, because proteins are more powerful. Then you run this program called MakeBlastDB. It builds an index of words and also blocks out those over-recurring um, words and things like that. Um, on a moderate size database, a few gigabytes, it probably takes like five or 10 minutes to build that BLAST database. And then you run your queries using the BLAST plus um, queries, BLAST n, BLAST x, whatever, against the database you just built. Um, this is something you could learn how to do 
in you know under half an hour just by reading the instructions. So if you do one of these big blast searches with lots of queries, you're going to get lots of results. So what to do with them? Um, NCBI has their own script called Blast Report 2, which uh, reads a lot of blast output and reformats it for ease of use. Just about everybody who is involved in bioinformatics has written their own blast parser at some point to read the output from blast and pull out the things that they're really looking for. But it's probably better to use uh, an existing module of an existing piece of software because first it's been validated so you don't have to prove that your blast parser is correct when you publish your result you just say I use such and such a tool and that's it um, also there's conservation of effort blast NCBI changes the code for blast really often particularly the web version but also the downloadables and so if you've written a blast parser and if everyone else in your class and every other first year graduate student has also written their own blast parser then every time some change happens in the code everyone's blast parser breaks and everyone has to correct all the errors with varying quality of results if you're all using one common code base like BioParthon blast XML then one person who knows what they're doing makes an improvement or a correction to blast xml the universe validates that yes it works correctly then all of you just download the latest va version of blast xml and you're good to go so there's there's substantial reason for commonly used tools to make use of shared code base rather than always write your own because you believe in building your own tools and, and mixing your own solutions. All right, Just a couple more advanced techniques that I'm going to hint at. Um, I already mentioned this iterative neighborhood cluster. For a very poor match you take the match and use that as the start for a second query then you ask is my original query similar to the results of that second query if not then probably my original query was not that interesting or doesn't have any real matches the match that I saw was by chance that this Inca thing automates it and I just like the idea of someone doing that making a tool that follows through on this theory of the transitive property Cyblast is a really important tool for working with protein families. It only works on proteins, but it does something theoretically interesting. Um, it starts with a single blast search, protein-based blast, and it's only going to give you any result if that initial blast search has some matches. So you can't use Cyblast if you have a sequence that has no database similarities. But if you have a one match and it's a little weak or you want to see what else is in the database that might be somewhat more distantly related or if you're really interested in gathering together a more comprehensive set of related sequences that say all share one common protein domain what Cyblast does is it takes your original blast search and from the matching and mismatching letters, it recomputes a novel scoring matrix. So it builds its own blossom table, essentially, just from the matches that have occurred in your sequence. That's really interesting if you think about it, because the blossom tables that we have are done for average proteins. But for one specific protein, the, the changes in amino acids are going to be different from the average. And what you will see is those mutations that are specifically tolerated in this family of proteins. And now you're going to go out into the database and look for more of the same. So show me variations on this theme. And it can learn. So after you've built your specific matrix and you've done a second search, and you've pulled in some additional matches, 
it takes all of those additional matches, rebuilds a multiple alignment, recalculates a new scoring matrix, and then uses that scoring matrix for a third search. And you can iterate several times. Usually what happens is the iterations will converge and you won't get any additional matches after recomputing the scoring table after like say three or four or five cycles. And so that extended set of proteins is now the full set of highly, well it's not highly stringent, it's highly specific search results that are tuned to that protein family. You'll also get false positives but there'll be interesting false positives. Okay, one more specific tool that you should know about called BLAT. BLAT is a BLAST-like alignment tool. So Jim Kent in 1999 building the human genome browser for UCSC needed a tool that could align lots of mRNAs onto the new complete human genome that he had just built. Um, since they're human mRNAs that are matching the human genome, we're not concerned about the sensitivity that BLAST can provide for those matches down at 70, 60 percent identity. But we are concerned about processing speed because there are hundreds of millions of human ESTs that have been reported in GenBank and he wanted to align them all. So it's designed to find nearly identical matches. And it works very well to match mRNA to the genome. It has essentially no gap penalty. It, instead, it has a stitching tool that takes regions of alignment and joins them together and produces one scoring statistic. So it does that thing that BLAST doesn't do of joining the regions of alignment, the HSPs, together. Um, and here's the quote, BLAT on DNA is designed to quickly find sequences of greater than or equal to 95% similarity of length 25 bases or more. BLAT on proteins finds sequences of 80% similarity of length at least 20 amino acids. So you have to have a query that's at least 25 bases long to use BLAT or you won't get any result but it happens very quickly. Uh, typically, you use BLAT on the UCSC website, but again, it's downloadable code, and if you have a lot of fragments from the same genome or a lot of mRNAs that you want to match to the same genome that they come from, this is a good tool. Um, it makes these... Uh, Actually, it doesn't make a stepping by five. That's wrong. BLAT makes 11 MERS, but non-overlapping 11 MERS. It breaks the query into a series of 11 MERS, and by default, it requires two to match with um, only one mismatch in each. So that really limits the search space a lot. Um, it won't work well for cross-species comparisons. It really is not designed for that. And here's a reference if you want to read more about it, Genome Research 2002. Um, typically, when you use it at the UCSC Genome Browser, what you really want to do is take a sequence and use that to jump to the matching location on the genome. A and it does that very well. But I have used it on occasion for other purposes to match a variety of experimental sequences to a local genome, and we have it installed on our compute cluster at Chibi. Okay, so that's it for the BLAST lecture. We talked about matching similar words, how two-word matches make the search faster, how the statistics are calculated, how BLAST deals with gaps, what it means by HSPs, and I briefly went over PsyBLAST and BLAT. There's a homework on the website, Blast Stuff, and do Sunday Midnight. Next lecture will be Probability. So, just a question. Is this yep. a final class? Hmm?
Yes, is my final. How are you going to evaluate? You're the course director, right? Um, actually, it's shared between me and David, but yeah. How's going to be the final evaluation of this class? We're going to give an exam that will include. What can we expect from this final exam? Um, questions that are similar to the homeworks. And we're expecting you all to pass. <laughs> this is not about weeding you out. It's about giving you some skills that we think are useful. 